Hello, and welcome to students and faculty and community to another iteration of A Plus D Monday is our weekly gathering where we welcome the people and ideas, the movements and practices that most compel the Berkeley faculty, students and our staff. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design, and it's my privilege to welcome you to another iteration of A Plus D Mondays and to invite you to join us routinely every Monday night as the academic year proceeds. Uh, some of you have already been tuning in to all of our events thus far, and some of you are just joining us for the first time tonight. That, thus, many of you know that this series usually takes place in our beautiful theater at FAM PFA. And many of you also know that this series is associated with a course, Humanities 20, that it is my privilege to guide. Hello, Home 20 students. And many of you also know that the series is co-curated by a range of campus organizations. If you've tuned in before, you've seen presentations co-hosted with the African American Student Development Office, the Department of Art Practice, Berkeley Center for New Media, Theater, Dance and Performance Studies, and the Arts and Advocacy Student Group of Berkeley Law. If you continue on, you'll hear more from those campus organizations as well as Cal Performances, the Grad School of Journalism, and many more. But tonight we have the privilege of welcoming an event conceived by the College of Environmental Design, indeed led by our new Dean of College of Environmental Design, Vishan Chakrabarti. I wanna tell you more about the plan for tonight, but before I do, I want to acknowledge uh, the land on which this gathering resides, even if we are gathering virtually tonight. UC Berkeley is sited on the unceded ancestral land of the Ohlone people. In acknowledging the history of this land, we acknowledge the history of the Ohlone people and also the fact that the Ohlone people are flourishing active members of the Berkeley community and of the Bay Area communities more broadly. Many of those gathered here tonight uh, for the series, for the course, understand Berkeley to be a special place, but we know that we are not the first to recognize or to settle or to celebrate this exceptional place that we call our campus. Indeed, Actually, for the last four years, this series has often thought about the politics and aesthetics of place. Many of you know that the series has been guided under different themes, including the nature of assembly, the politics of fact and fiction, uh, and also last year's series around democracy and equity. All of those themes, of course, are uncannily resonant for us now in fall 2020 as a political pandemic uh, and an environmental pandemic and a physiological pandemic collide to confuse our understandings of fact and fiction, to unsettle our ideas of proximate assembly, and also to expose the 400 centuries long history of decidedly undemocratic practice that has entrenched racist structures throughout US governance models. Those are fraught histories on which to gather, but those are the histories that have guided our series and will guide us tonight, especially as we think about the politics and aesthetics of gathering as such. Along the way, we've already been asking, what does it mean to gather at all online and offline as we do now? What is the relation between that, the answer to that question and other necessary forms of gathering, um, activist forms and protest forms offline and online? And moreover for us, what is the role of arts and design fields in propelling and memorializing that kind of necessity? One could not imagine two more exciting interlocutors to address those questions and allied questions about the future of the arts, the future of social justice, and the future of togetherness uh, here on a shared planet than the two I have the pleasure of introducing tonight. Vishan Chak Chakrabarte, as I said, is our new Dean, our William Worcester Dean of the College of Environmental Design at UC Berkeley, while continuing as founder and creative director of Practice for Architecture and Urban, um, Urbanism, PAU, in New York. His highly acclaimed book, A Country of Cities, A Manifesto for Urban America, argues that a more urban United States would result in a more prosperous, sustainable, and joyous nation. Of course, as COVID-19 has prompted cities expeditiously to reimagine our streets, our sidewalks, 
our parks and our parking lots, our residences and our places of work. His ideas are all too resonant now and you can find up to the minute reflections from him in op-eds and other pieces um, from the New York Times to SF Chronicle. Past work in his portfolio is wide ranging and includes commissions from a number of different um, institutions. It includes a mixed use village in Mongolia, a social housing neighborhood in East New York, a master plan for the Michigan Central Station in Detroit. And he has been in his past, the planning director for Manhattan after the 9-11 attacks. Chakrabarti holds dual bachelor's degrees at, in art history and engineering, a nice combo from Cornell, a master of city planning from MIT and a master of architecture from UC Berkeley. And needless to say, we're thrilled to have him back here leading as a campus leader at his alma mater. Chakrabarti is here to lead a dialogue with Darren Walker, a person whose capacities for visionary thinking, transformational leadership, and nuanced implementation are arguably amongst the best in the country, and some say the globe. Walker is president of the Ford Foundation, a $13 billion international social justice philanthropy. And because he has that role, that means he does and has done many things. And I'll just list a few of them tonight. He's a member of Governor Cuomo's Reimagining New York Commission and co-chair of the New York City Census 2020. He chaired the philanthropy committee that brought a resolution to the city of Detroit's historic bankruptcy. Before joining Ford, Walker was vice president at Rockefeller Foundation, overseeing global and domestic programs. Walker co-chairs New York City's Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers, and has served on the Independent Commission on New York City's Crit Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform and the UN International Labor Organization Global Commission on the Future of Work. He co-founded both the US Impact Investing Alliance and the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy. He serves on many boards, including the Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the National Gallery of Art, uh, Carnegie Hall, the High Line, the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Academy, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the recipient of many, many, many honorary degrees and awards, including Harvard's W.E.B. Du Bois Medal. He was educated exclusively at public schools and uh, was a member of the first class of Head Start in 1965. All of his degrees are from UT Austin. These lists, the, those lists of honors and achievements coincide with a history, obviously, of so many projects, activities, initiatives, and creative acts, both small ones and big ones. Throughout, Walker is known for his ability to reimagine whatever field or institution he is simultaneously leading. That includes his reimagining of the nature of philanthropy, evidenced in texts like the new gospel of wealth, that includes his positioning of the social role of the arts as evidenced in everything I listed above, as well as his decision to transform and diversify the Ford Foundation's art collection and to support the careers of artistic risk takers and change makers, whether they be performing artists like Anna Devere Smith or visual artists like Mark Bradford or poets like Elizabeth Alexander. If you ask highly connected art heroes, whether Thelma Golden, Golden at um, Studio Museum of Harlem or Tom Finkelpearl, formerly head of the Cultural Commission at, in New York, they will all tell you that no one is better connected or more able to make connection than Darren Walker. Who better than to help us think tonight about the nature of togetherness? So without further ado, welcome to A Plus D Mondays and whether you're muted or not, help me give a warm welcome to Dean Vishan Chakrabarte and Darren Walker. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon, for those warm introductions. And Darren, thank you so much. We know we're, you're joining us from the East Coast where it is much later and we really, really, you know, in addition, I have known Darren for years. In addition to all of those extraordinary accomplishments that Shannon just listed, he is also among the nicest, most humble human beings I know. So I really thank you for spending the time with us tonight. Are you kidding? It's a huge honor. Shannon was far too generous and it's a great uh, pleasure for me. Uh, so as you know, it's, it's 
only 9.30 here. And as a, as a New Yorker, Vishan, you know, uh, this is a late for us. <laughs> right. You're in the city that never sleeps. Right. Exactly. Even, even, even in a pandemic, no. <laughs> we, we still never sleep. Well, good, good. I'm glad you're revved up and ready to go. I know people are really, really looking forward to what you have to say tonight and in the, in the discussion. So I just want to start with, I mean, that extraordinary introduction. I mean, Darren, you're a Swiss army knife, you're a polymath. I think you're an author, a philanthropist, you're in politics, business, design, the arts. I can't think of a field uh, that your work and your background hasn't touched. And I just wonder if you could start with just a little bit about how your personal story interweaves all of these different disciplines and especially your passion for the arts and design. Well, thank you uh, so much. And I, I, uh, I'll be brief on this because I could um, talk a long time about that, but I will just say that for me, uh, I feel lucky every day in this country, even um, during these dark, diminishing, demoralizing, depressing days. Uh, I feel lucky and grateful because I do live in a country that has made my story, my journey possible. And I know that this country is a place where one of the few places in the world where a black queer boy uh, born in a charity hospital in a small town in rural Louisiana uh, could um, actually dream and realize those dreams. But those dreams were made possible by the idea of investing in human capital and uh, a belief that little boys and girls who like me lived uh, in a small town on a dirt road in a little shotgun house where in 1965, a lady appeared on the road talking to me and our neighbors about a new program called Head Start. And that program, uh, I, as Shannon said, I was lucky enough to be in the first class. And that was uh, transformational for me because it, I think, encouraged my curiosity and my love of reading and my thirst for knowledge. And even though my own personal situation was not ideal, it allowed my creativity and my interest in the world and what was outside of that little town to, to be encouraged and, and to foment. And, and so I feel really lucky. And, and my story is a story of, of living in a nation where in the 1960s, growing up in the 1970s, in spite of the fact that I was low income, I was gay in a small town, which wasn't always ideal, I felt like my country was cheering me on. I never felt that I would not be able to succeed in America. And what I worry about today is that little boys and girls like me, 50 years later, do not feel that their country is cheering them on. They do not feel that their dreams, their aspirations are actually realizable. I love though, and I have to tell you, I have always loved the built environment and urbanity. I remember as a little boy watching Green Acres a program that was probably before you were born and certainly no, before. No, no, that's not true. I remember it quite well. I, you know, even as a gay little boy watching Green Acres, I used to look at that and at the part where Ava Gabor would come out and say, you know, I'm living in this apartment on Park Avenue and I am leaving it for this man to go to Hootersville, I would yell at the television, don't do it, lady, don't do it. I live in Hootersville. I'm telling you, stay in Park, on Park Avenue. Don't give up Times Square. No man is worth giving up Times Square and Park Avenue for. I'm sorry, but it was my understanding of what city life was. It was my idea of 
of what it was like to live in a sophisticated metropolis. And I always wanted to live in a city and cities. And for me, Houston and Dallas were just mammoth places. And I always remember uh, noticing the architecture. Uh, and my grandmother, uh, my grandparents lived in Houston and were domestics for a family um, in a neighborhood called River Oaks. And we used to drive uh, into Houston occasionally. And we drive through the neighborhoods and we drive through downtown. And I remember seeing the Skidmore project of the old Humble oil building, which is now the Exxon uh, oil, oil headquarters, downtown Houston. And it looked cool to me, even as a little boy. I knew there was something special about that building. And I remember when Philip Johnson's uh, projects for the Manils started to come um, to for uh, the Rothko Chapel, uh, the First Republic Bank building. Um, as you know, he did so many projects in Houston for the Manils. And I just knew that there was something really interesting about this. And uh, over time, and when I got to college, I, um, I knew I had no talent and couldn't be an architect but I loved design and I've always loved design. And as you know, uh, living here in New York, I uh, immerse myself. You can luxuriate in design here in New York. So Derek, what, what changed? So much of what you just said resonates with me. You know, mid sixties were a, a really extraordinary period in this society. You know, my parents came here with $32 and from Calcutta, India, where I was born. I was born in a nursing home in Calcutta. And, you know, only years later did I realize it was because, of course, Lyndon Johnson had liberalized the immigration laws mm -hmm. that allowed our, our family to come. And, you know, we were born into a nation that had a history of racism and slavery and all sorts of problems. And so no one can gloss over that. But at the same time, it does feel like there was a period that doesn't seem to be as quite vibrant anymore, where the, it, was a, it was a nation of magnanimity. Of, of, there was a sort of general head start, opening up immigration, civil rights, women's rights, and then everything changed to get us to what you are now calling this particular dark moment. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts um, you know, when you say, well, you don't, you worry that little boys and girls don't look up and necessarily feel that their society cares for them the same way. Um, you know, what, what changed in your mind? Well, when I was a little boy in the 60s, people read and talked about John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson and Robert Frost. These these politicians who certainly saw uh, the idea of service, of public service, as the highest noble calling one could have, the idea of, of, of working in government, working in, in service. Poets and artists like Frost, who talked about service, those were the, the, the sort of signature ideas of my youth, but by the time I got to college in the 80s, people were talking more about Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand. And if you were to ask me what happened, a lot of things happened, but certainly what happened in corporate America around this idea of shareholder capitalism, Milton Friedman's seminal essay where he said the role of the corporation is to make money uh, and the idea of a corporation having a social responsibility is is a subversive idea uh, that was incredible projection to me because his idea was the subversive idea but he convinced uh, corporations and business schools who generated an entire uh, generation or two of people who thought like that. And then we had, of course, the cult of Ayn Rand uh, and this idea of, uh, of, of, of objectivism and of uh, a hostility towards 
anything collective and communal. Um, I mean, I remember uh, in Austin, Texas, first reading this woman and any person who would say altruism is a disease, uh, it is hard for me to understand uh, the, the widespread admiration for her philosophy, which is held today by many, many people, uh, both in public life and in, uh, in, in corporate America, uh, which is a part of why we have moved from this notion of uh, the public square to the cult of the individual. And I think that is what has changed fundamentally about our society. So we don't talk about service right. anymore. I don't, I don't hear people talking about service, except getting ready, doing community service for their resume to get into a good college. So, you know, just staying on that, you know, um, we all, I, I think the ideas of the way in which economic neoliberalism, Friedman spread through the economy is something that's quite well understood, um, at least by by a lot of people. Um, but you're, you're mentioning something in tandem with that, which is the cultural piece, as you talk about Ayn Rand. And and what I think is interesting is, you know, it's interesting in her books, the the, the people who are like in the Fountainhead, the architects who are also interested in public service or politics are are. Real, are, are antagonists almost. They're, they're, they're or losers. Yes. They're, they're, they're right there, right? And so they're the. I mean, they are the antagonists, right? Because they're not the purists that Howard Rourke yes. is, right? Obviously. So I'm just really curious about. So do you feel like simultaneously with that shift in our economic system, the way in which corporations and shareholders worked, as you're mentioning? that there was a kind of parallel shift happening in the arts and design world that through the 80s and 90s, that cult of the individual, that belief that if you, were, if you cared about public service, you couldn't be a great artist. Do you think that permeated the art world as much as it did the world of economics and public policy? Well, I certainly think that we, uh, we saw it in the art world. I mean, we saw the uh, beginning in the 60s, but it really took off in the 80s, certain kinds of, uh, of artists. We saw artists, we saw star architects, uh, we saw uh, uh, the kind of narcissism uh, manifest uh, through um, the work of particular artists or architects. Um, there's no doubt uh, that there was uh, uh, a look at me, I'm rich, uh, dimension to to the the presentation and 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 creativity and uh, productivity of a lot of of artists and architects and designers, but I think there was also real courage uh, on the part of artists because artists do something others don't do. Artists hold the mirror up to us. And artists, artists demand of us that we look at ourselves. And, and so I think of, you know, there is no more species on the planet more resilient and more courageous than the artist. Um, and, and I believe that yes, while those trends were accelerating at the same time, you had artists saying, uh, this is a problem, America. Uh, what we are embracing is going to be the end of us if we don't monitor this and manage this better. Yeah, and, and you can certainly think of examples of both. I mean, you're absolutely right in the architecture world. We had examples of both. We still have examples of both. So now if you fast forward to this moment um, and you think about how the cultural world must reckon with all of this history, dating back to 1619, you know, the, what's, you served on this mayoral advisory commission for cities and monuments um, in terms of understanding what do we do in New York City with, you know, uh, very, you know, pieces with very fraught histories in terms of uh, slavery, you know, et cetera. You've also been embroiled in your own recent controversies at the National Gallery with, with Philip Guston now and all that. 
the, the way in which we grapple with history in the cultural community, I can think of very few people who've had to deal with this as specifically as you have, even in the most recent terms. I mean, what do you come away with in terms of the challenges of that? Well, I think part of the challenge is that we in this country have never reckoned with our racialized caste history. We were taught a romanticized idea of America, American exceptionalism and the specialness of this country, the genius and brilliance of our founding fathers, uh, the uh, luminosity of our founding documents in their ability to continue to evolve and be shaped. But we were not told the full history of who we are as a people. And so the challenge today is that we are coming to grips with that, not because we necessarily want to, but because we have to. And let me be clear, let us, let me, the we here especially are white Americans who for generations uh, benefited from um, a system that privileged whiteness. And, uh, and many people themselves, not racist, not intentional, not getting up every day saying, I wanna be a racist, but participating as a member of a society with institutions that were imbued with racism. And, and so we today, certainly in the wake of the murders of this summer, can no longer deny racism was always a deniable thing on the part of whites. Whites could always, it's not as bad and oh, I'm not sure he shot him in the back. I, I never saw, so he said she's, well, now we know. Uh, and after George Floyd, that murder uh, where the officer looking into the camera assumed that he could literally kill a black man in broad daylight with impunity. And I think that moment, those eight minutes, so shocked white America that many, many people, and I've had friends say to me, that was heartbreaking for me to watch. And of course, hearts were broken, but the, heart, the hearts of African-Americans and others in this country have been broken for 400 years over the racism. So that is a historic diagnosis. And today, pivoting to this question of Augusta now and museums, as someone who always believes that an artist will help us get out of the quagmire, that art is a way to understand Museums in this country are in a crisis. And so this isn't really about Guston, although I will address that. This is about an entire sector, museums, who until recently, their, their role, and, the, and their role continues to be to tell us, interpret who we are as a people. And we learn that by what is on the walls of museums, what's in the public programs of museums, who works at museums, who are the curators, the directors, the decision makers. And until recently, who we are as a people was a pretty settled thing. We were based on what you saw on the walls of museums, we were white, Western, European, and things that were other than that were at the margins. 
if represented at all. And so the experiences of Native Americans, in fact, the Metropolitan Museum, which has had an, an American wing for over a century, only three years ago, moved the Native American collection to the American wing of the museum because the Native American collection was, was with what used to be called primitive, which was where African art, Oceana, et cetera, was because those narratives were marginal to telling American people who we were. And the people who created the scholarship, who created the narrative arc of art history in America were white, male, and the artists and what was on the wall. So that's who we were and that's how it was represented. And the people who did that curation and storytelling themselves were white, elite, highly educated, et cetera. So today museums are in crisis because they actually can't tell the story of who we are because many museums are not equipped to tell the story of who we are because they haven't been trained to tell that story. They've been trained to tell another story, the old story. And so what museums are struggling with is how do we tell these stories? And so in the case of Guston, as a lover of Philip Guston and someone who, whose own personal story, his own experience as a Jewish American with racism, with anti-Semitism, his own culpability as he just talks about and writes about with his whiteness and understanding that privilege, but also Guston's own art and his self-awareness and his deep commitment to anti-racism is, is something that has always attracted me to his work. The National Gallery, as the storyteller of Guston, a show that was organized over five years ago, right now in this moment, mm -hmm. the director with support from the trustees agreed that we could not present that show because like many museums that present works with painful iconography, hurtful images, lynchings, Klansmen, et cetera, even told through the narrative of an artist committed to anti-racism needs to be programmed initially by asking the black people who work at the museum, what do you think about this? Museums have never done that when it comes to the images of black and brown and native people that are on their walls. White curators sit in a conference room and decide what goes on the walls and how the story is going to be told. And what is changing today is new directors like the amazing Kay Wynn Feldman at the National Gallery is saying to the curators and to the organizers, so did we ever ask, did we ever ask anybody what, what their reaction is to these images? And, and, and simply saying it, it's an insult to the audience. The audience can't, uh, we are confident the audience will understand this. Who's the audience when you say that? And there are people in audiences who have no interest in understanding. They want to exploit the images. They have no interest in the catalog and the scholarly essays. They want those images of hate. 
because we live in a time where hate is being exalted. We live in a time where at the highest levels, white supremacy is being tolerated. And so context matters. And it is painful for me as someone who generally believes that all art always is right on time to say that in October of 2020, 20 plus paintings of Klansmen and lynchings on the wall of the National Gallery presents a grave challenge for the museum. Do you think there was any way to contextualize it had those conversations taken place with the African-American staff members or board members, you know? Or the community. Or the community. Yes. Do you think yes. there was no, a way to get that? I think there is stuff? absolutely. But this is my point about how museums have to change. Yeah. So if you understand how elite museums are organized, so the National Gallery is like most museums, the decision makers, the, 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 the people who decide what's gonna be on the walls are primarily white and often male. So in full transparency, the National Gallery has 40 plus curators the National Gallery in Washington, all white. Not one African-American on the curatorial team. And so the, what, what you see happen is that a group of white decision makers design things. And often what happens is a black consultant is brought in. And so, and again, we see these patterns the black consultant is brought in and that black consultant validates the decisions of the white decision makers. Yeah. And we see these patterns metastasize in society. And, and then when criticism comes or uh, blowback comes, um, the black or brown person is put out front by the group of white decision makers who say, you see, we're not racist. Look, this black person says that what we're doing is just fine. Yeah. So I'm really curious. I would, I'd love to broaden this out and ask you, I think, a very difficult question. Um, I listened with great interest to your conversation with Michael Sendell and about his fascinating book, The Tyranny of Merit, where the two of you in your discussion really tackled this question of meritocracy in, in the United States. And I was hoping to apply that question to this question of the world of arts, design, museums, and so forth. Because, and, and, and forgive me if I'm not as articulate about this, I'm gonna try. Um, there is an undercurrent right now that these professions, and especially in the cultural world, that have not been diverse and that the artists or architects that have been premiated have come from a very privileged group of people. There is this undercurrent that if we diversify, it means that we're going to lose excellence, that we're gonna lose merit. Um, and I find that kind of thinking to be absolutely shocking because the, the underlying assumption, right, that, you know, is that, well, before we were using a fair judge of merit or excellence, and it just happened that through that very fair process, all the abstract expressionists were white men, except for a couple, all of the great architects of the 50s, 60s, and 70s were white men, except for a couple, and that, you, you know, so obviously that was not a fair a set of criteria for what determined excellence. And so, you know, in taking on the idea of merit, how do we not undermine the idea that in order to be in the National Gallery, in order to be premiated, in order to have this broader sense of what excellence entails, that that is not a watering down of merit, but changing the way we think about merit and excellence in culture. 
Um, because that to me also seems to be part of the issue for museums and for lovers of culture that there seems to be this kind of, um, you know, that if we diversify, it's a, I, I, I've been told at different points in my life that I had arrived at some place because there were quotas or something like that, you know? So, you know, I, I'm sure you understand what I'm getting at. Oh, I understand here. exactly what you're saying. And I believe, first of all, uh, I and you, when we are confronted with that ideology, we should be very clear that it is deeply resented and it is also not supported by the evidence. Because in fact, what research shows is that groups, organizations that are more diverse are more excellent. So for me, when I talk about diversity, I'm talking about excellence. Diversity will make you better, will make you more resilient. Uh, and so I think we have to acknowledge as you have just give, given a recitation of the art world, that this was also about power. And yes, it is true that there were uh, a group of men, primarily white men, um, who in the 20th century were deemed uh, the great artists by other white men. Um, but that is because those who are the gatekeepers hold power. And those gatekeepers have a vested interest in status quo. And it's why, as you say, in the 60s, uh, yes, uh, it was white men and they decided, uh, uh, Clement Greenberg and a couple of other white men decided that uh, Helen Frankenthaler uh, could be let in. And so there could be, uh, uh, in the 60s, there could be Joan Mitchell. Um, and then in the 70s, there could be Helen Frankenthaler. And so every you got one, right? right? Um, and, and, but that was about power uh, as much as it was about art. So let us not kid ourselves. Uh, yes, uh, Jackson Pollock was a great artist, but uh, I actually prefer his wife, Lee Krasner, who also was a genius of right. an artist and completely overlooked because she was a woman. Um, and I could go on and on. Um, and, and so I guess what I'm saying is the, the reason uh, there is the backlash is because excellence and who gets to decide that is changing. So the gatekeepers are changing and the gatekeepers we know in various spheres, spheres of American life are in particular industries, they're in particular uh, sectors. Uh, and so in my sector, in philanthropy, the fact that you have at the Ford Foundation, a black queer man, at the Mellon Foundation, a black woman poet, at uh, the uh, uh, Kellogg Foundation, a black community organizer, right? right? These institutions look very different. I mean, today, Elizabeth Alexander at the Mellon Foundation announced a quarter billion dollar initiative focused on reinterpreting monuments in American life for the future. And the whole, the idea of that is rooted in our historical elevation of white supremacist iconography with a reality of how in the future, when we memorialize, when we mark and we decide who is worthy of being on the plants, that we have a more expansive view of who our heroes and sheroes are. And will that take more than just a change to who the gatekeepers are? Won't it, I mean, doesn't it also require a change to the gates themselves? Absolutely. Uh, it, it will require a different, this, it, 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 is, it is not simply putting black bodies in the corner office and saying, oh, radical things are going to happen. 
It, it must right. be more than that. Um, we have to rethink the underlying systems and structures. And, and so it is not just about uh, populating um, uh, elite institutions with Blacks and Latinx and Natives, uh, Asians, et cetera. It is, it is about in, it is about interrogating and excavating those systems and structures that perpetuate uh, the kind of hierarchical uh, uh, outcomes that make it so difficult for so many people to feel that they have opportunity in this country. Right. And so, you know, it's so how do you think about this question of how does one um, redefine excellence in that paradigm? I think excellence in a diverse world has elements that we haven't thought about before. So uh, something like representation, organizations that are more representative will be more excellent. So let's just take corporate America right now. There are many boards of corporate America, many C-suites where there are no blacks or Latinx or natives. Those boards, those organizations in the wake of this summer were exposed in ways that could have been avoided and they could have been more excellent mm -hmm. They could have been more resilient, more effective, more productive if they had different diverse boards, C-suites, who brought that thinking, the thinking of diversity, the experience of different backgrounds, life experiences. If that had been brought to the table, the reason so many organizations were panicked and issuing these absurd platitudes was because they had no authentic capability. And so where was that expertise that would have made them excellent? It was missing because they didn't value it. And had they valued it, they would have been prepared to respond to calls for accountability. They would have been prepared to more authentically engage and not be running around looking for any black person they could find to come and help them get through this crisis. So I use that as an example to say institutions need all kinds of capabilities, capacities, and assets. And the assets that are going to matter in the future will also include a capability of dealing with a diverse America, a country that is changing. And as any capitalist enterprise knows, you want to evolve. Mm -hmm. You don't want to actually stay stuck because the consumer is changing, the client base is changing. And therefore, you've always said the thing that you must do, you must do to remain competitive, to remain excellent, is continue to evolve. But in this instance, that evolution requires you to change fundamental behavior and to give up some of your privilege. And that's where the rub is. So Garrett, I know the two of us could go on and on and we don't have the time to go on and on. I wanna make sure we get, there's some questions in the chat. Please, let's get to the questions. I, yeah, well, I just wanna ask, I want to ask you two quick things before we get to the questions. One is you're talking about institutions evolving. If you could give us an incredibly brief summary of a very important and expansive topic, which is how you've changed the institution of the Ford Foundation itself. You renamed it, you rethought your headquarters, and you rethought your mission, because I just think it's important to ground what you just said 
in an example. And I think what you've done at the foundation is such a concrete example. So can you give us a quick summary? Just a so quick very, summary. Very unfair, I'm sorry. No, 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 we, I wanna to get to the, to the questions. I think when you're a leader of an organization, uh, you need, particularly when that organization is going to go through significant change, you must have markers of that change that are signatures. So uh, at Ford, that was uh, our focus on social justice to name that as a as a uh, an imperative for our work. So uh, to take our landmark building, which you know and love so much, uh, that Kevin Roche uh, amazing building, and uh, turn it inside out in terms of making it more open to the public, uh, uh, having it uh, be uh, literally open to the public, having um, public events in the space the art gallery, the art uh, collection, as you said, we had over 400 works of art that was in um, the original collection, all European, um, one American woman. The trustees agreed to, to my request that we deaccession it. We sold the entire collection and um, have uh, acquired uh, over 300 uh, works, um, um, about 70% uh, by artists of color, queer artists, artists of, um, uh, of immigrant uh, backgrounds. Um, and, and it's a very different feel in the building. Um, move, uh, move the kind of uh, grant making that we do, um, made it more clearly racial justice focused, more equity focused. Uh, and, and what that does is it, and, and um, moved from project support to general operating support. We now, over 70% of our grants are general operating support. And what that looks like in our, the manifestation of a, a programmatically is what we announced last week in our arts program, America's Cultural Treasures, um, a program um, that will uh, in, in, in total be about $180 million. Um, all of the grantees in that program are black, indigenous, people of color, uh, cultural organizations ranging from the Studio Museum um, in, in Harlem and, and uh, Alvin Ailey and Dance Theater of Harlem to, to Wing Luke um, and the Mexican Museum um, in Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. These are all great uh, American cultural treasures. They just haven't been recognized. And what we wanna do from an equity standpoint is to elevate and support them um, through a period when they're gonna need a lot of capital. And so we're making big grants, um, average $4 million, um, all general operating support, one payment right now this year so that they can be financially resilient through this uh, crisis. Amazing. Well, it's not amazing. Uh, I'm happy for, for questions. So, okay. Um, one person asks, what can or should white artists be doing to help promote and contribute to positive change? I think white artists uh, have a role to play both as allies in the struggle for recognition that has for so long uh, eluded uh, artists of color uh, in large part because uh, artists of color have been overlooked. Uh, I also think white artists can use their voice, um, their voice in validating, in, uh, in encouraging um, the messages of justice and helping us understand that intersection of art and justice and how in America we cannot be a more just nation if we don't have art. Uh, art helps develop one's empathy. Um, when we look around our country and we look at leaders and we look at people we see in the public sphere and we hear them use language that does not recognize the humanity of other human beings that who use degrading language to talk about other human beings, you know this is a person who has never read Kipling or <laughs> James Baldwin or Edith Wharton or Zora Neale Hurston. They have never engaged in a beautiful painting. They have never uh, engaged in great theater. Uh, they have never loved literature uh, because 
any person who immerses him or herself in that, those things, is a person who will have empathy, empathy and who will see the dignity in every human being. Uh, beautifully said. Um, does Darren have a view of the facing change initiative in museums that began pre-COVID and before the killing of George Floyd, but he seems to align with both his comments and my questions? I know a little bit about uh, facing change and it, and it um, is a critical initiative that is helping museums. And this is, there are a number of, um, of initiatives like this that are all meant to help museums get on the journey, right? To, 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 but, but let me just take a step back and at the end of the day, the power in museums lies in museum boards and, uh, and museum boards are populated with very privileged, primarily white people. And uh, privileged people do not like giving up their privilege and they don't like being challenged when they feel that they are doing something generous, civic minded um, and for the public good. Um, and so when you have a situation like we saw at the Whitney or you're seeing at LACMA um, and these places when trustees are being um, um, criticized publicly for how they might make uh, their uh, their fortunes or whatever. Um, it, 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 a lot of people are really offended by that. I actually think uh, it's a fair critique. Um, and, and, you know, it makes a lot of people really uncomfortable and really unhappy. But I think part of this moment that we're in is we privileged people. And I consider myself a part of, I've lived in the, I was born in the 1%. Bottom of the 1% now live in the top 1%. And let me tell you, there's a big difference. And the privilege that I now have, and a lot of people like me have, we need to be thinking about not what are we going to give back, but what are we willing to give up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Darren, I'm cognizant of your time. And I, uh, you know, uh, some of the questions are similar to one another. Uh, there's one question about uh, that I think is quite important about you know, because it ties together a lot of our worlds. It talks about what can museums uh, across the country do to help eradicate things like redlining or policies that are inher inherent to uh, promote socially segregated neighborhoods. So I think it's a really interesting question. It's because in it is embedded this hope that cultural institutions can actually do things like impact urban policy, help create awareness of a lot of the things that have happened in our country in recent history, not just in terms of slavery and Jim Crow, but really, you know, some of the things that happened in the 20th century that really created a lot of the systemic racism in this country. Uh, you have a specific- Yeah, I mean, I just, I think we're, we're in, we are in a moment when what role museums play and cultural organizations, institutions play in society is up for grabs. And, uh, and there is a resistance to museums moving beyond their traditional roles of purveyors of knowledge. And by the way, museums are not unbiased arbiters. I mean, museums uh, are uh, clearly come with a perspective and an, ideolo an, an ideology about art. Um, but I think there is pressure now to say museums should be more than uh, the institution with at the top of the step, the curator standing there and waving the wand over you to come in, that actually museums are social actors in society and have influence because they tell us who we are and they tell us what we value. So these questions about redlining and social justice uh, are fundamental and museums are going, well, museums that want to be successful in the future are going to have to grapple with them. Mm -hmm. And this is where the mismatch is because I had one museum director say to me, I don't know anything about social justice. I am a Renaissance paintings scholar. And that is actually why my museum hired me and why they wanted me to be the leader. Uh, not because I, 
my response to that museum director was, then you better get some help because I love Renaissance paintings, but that is not going to be a qualification in the future alone that mm -hmm. will position you to lead a museum. You will need to understand context and understand how those Renaissance paintings are contextualized in 21st century right. America. Right, right. So I wanna close with one last question because you started with something about how dark the times are. And we have a lot of students listening. We have a lot of people listening who really are looking for some hope and inspiration and aspiration at this moment, especially for the students. What, what would you ask them to look towards to find you know, hope in what is a very dark moment? Well, first of all, I will say while there is darkness, there is so much reason for hope. I was hopeful and am hopeful when I looked across this country and the world in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and saw the waves, literally hundreds of thousands of people marching in ways in which we have never marched in this country. White, black, brown, poor, rich, rural, urban. So there were Black Lives Matters marches in Boise, Idaho. There were people who never have marched in their life who were in the streets. That gave me a reason for hope. And when you meet, I, I, I feel this genuinely. It's why I love doing commencements. If you wanna be hopeful, go to a college campus. If you want to feel like there is re reason to be joyous and to believe in the possibility, it will affirm to you that things are not as bad as we think they are. So you are lucky, Vishan, because you are there Very on that lucky. amazing, beautiful Berkeley campus with all of those incredible, brilliant young people. And so you get to luxuriate in, and be inspired by all that they have to offer. And aren't you lucky? We are, I am very lucky. I'm very privileged. I uh, am looking for the day, looking forward to the day we get to luxuriate in person again. Um, <laughs> and as soon as that happens, we will issue a letter to you inviting you to speak at our commencement. Uh, but but until, that, until then, Darren, please accept my gratitude, our gratitude. Darren, you know, uh, you really are a gift to humanity. You're an extraordinary I am, person. Oh, you are, and that, oh, that, heads, that head start. I, I am, I am simply happy to be sense. here. And I hope that it was worth your time and the students and everyone. I feel, you know, um, this, is, this is a lot to take an hour out of your students and, and guest uh, time. So thank you for um, allowing me to, to be with you. We are so grateful to you, Darren. Have a beautiful night. Thank you. Time to walk the dog. <laughs> Take care. You Don't know what that's like. I know, I do. Take care. <laughs>